Thanks everyone. It's a absolute pleasure to be here. It's at least five degrees warmer here and spring is two works, weeks further ahead than it is in Norwich. It's like coming to a different country, it's nice. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about our work today. So I am a, um, a plant biologist and uh, maybe an aspiring bioengineer. As a biologist, I'm interested in the hidden complexity of plants. Um, and I think the thing that most attracted me to working on plants is that hidden behind this lovely, peaceful, serene greenness is that plants are always, you know, fighting this invisible battle to remodel their metabolism and growth to enable them to persist in environments that they can't uh, walk away from the way that I can. So, for example, the things that we're interested in are that root cells might be fine tuning the expressions of thousands of genes to make sure that their roots grow in the right directions to obtain or to be able to access these pockets, these pools of nutrients within the soil. And at the same time, plants will be um, curating, producing this arsenal of chemicals to attract pollinators, fight pathogens, uh, deter herbivores, communicate with other plants. So, as biologists, we are. Um, or interested in understanding that complexity and how it evolved. And as biotechnologists, we're aiming to leverage those understandings to engineer resilient crops and to uh, use some of these molecules for agriculture, medicine and industry. So how do we do this? Um, so in our lab, we kind of have three main areas of research. First of all, we study regulatory sequences and um, particularly we use rebuilding approaches to investigate the intrinsic properties of these sequences and how specific functional elements contribute to um, uh, uh, regulatory function. And the reasons that we're interested in pursuing those questions in that direction is because uh, interactions between proteins and regulatory DNA underpin gene regulatory networks, which are at the core of um, uh, many important plant phenotypes. And here we're interested in using our understanding of cis regulatory functions to inform the rational engineering of uh, networks with the aim of understanding and modulating uh, quantitative phenotypes and understanding how they emerge from network functions. So the other part of my lab are definitely metabolism um, and we work there we use particularly integrated omics to identify novel molecules and investigate how chemical novelty evolves in plants. Um, uh, and uh, then those two areas come together where we can combine our knowledge of green gene regulation with our knowledge of metabolic pathways and uh, for light driven production of useful molecules for agriculture and industry. And then also applying tools like genome engineering uh, for um, chassis improvement. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try and give you a taste of like three different three different areas of how these uh, work. Um, I'm going to speak about them in a slightly different audio because it makes more sense when I'm talking. So I'm going to start by talking about our work to understand and engineer regulatory sequences and their networks, um, then talk about how we use those to program molecules, and then I'll uh, talk at the end about um, understand uh, discovery of some um, pathways and how this would feed back into this cycle. So the first half of my talk basically will be about regulation and I'm going to talk to you about some start by talking about some older work that uh, where we use uh, rebuilding approaches to understand how cis regulatory elements contribute to regulatory function and how we were able to use that for the computational design of minimal synthetic promoters and then uh, how we then apply those same techniques into rewiring networks for elucidating networks and we're starting to rewire those for um, plant uh, root growth in response to nitrate. So to begin our work in uh, regulation, which started a while ago, back, back when I started my lab in 2016, um, Yamin was the postdoc that started leading that, and he began to investigate some of the very commonly used regulatory elements to understand how they work and to see if he could find rules to inform the bottom up rebuilding of minimal synthetic regulatory sequences for plants. So one of the things that he found, bearing in mind that plant, I know I rec recognize that many of you will work on microbes and you won't have this problem of multicellularity. But one of the important things that we found in our constitutive, by which we generally mean expressed across all cell types, was that those elements have the capacity to bind a wide range of transcription factors, but the transcription factors themselves that regulate those constitutive, constitutive regulatory elements are not themselves constitutively expressed. 
So in other words, constitutive expression is not dependent on the steady state protein presence of a group of transcription factors to control that uh, uh, promoter, but rather on the ability to kind of uh, hedge your bets and recruit different suites of proteins in different cell types. So we can see this in older works where people have done um, you know, deletion experiments of those promoters. And what you typically see when you start doing deletions of constitutive promoters, and you'll find that sub subparts of those constitutive promoters have very tissue specific patterns of expression. If we also then use more modern data, for example, now if we look across single cell sequencing data at constitutive expression patterns, we'll see that they are constitutive, but their expression is varying wildly in response in, in across different cell and tissue types. And it also explains why in bulk sequencing data, um, uh, we see multiple transcriptional start sites for constitutive genes, whereas for tissue specific and condition responsive genes, they're usually responding to a small uh, number of particular transcription factors associated with that conditional cell type. They have a very defined start of transcription. This is important, whereas uh, these types of um, promoters, which also tend to lack tata boxes, uh, they're using different groups of transcription factors in different cell types, and therefore you have a range of different transcriptional start sites. OK, so this is all really useful information for us for starting to build minimal uh, um, promoters that are going to be either responsive or non-responsive to different conditions. Um, and we use this data then to, or we use this to harvest uh, cis regulatory elements, and then we can start placing them into a synthetic promoter chassis and start to understand how the numbers, their relative positions influenced each other. So to do that, first of all, we have this basic minimal synthetic promoter chassis. It's about 150 base pairs, has a few fixed regions, and then this variable region into which we can put our cis regulatory elements. Uh, and we can test its dynamic range by using orthogonal or binding sites for an orthogonal transcription factor. When we put the, the binding sites for those in, as we would expect, um, expression goes up in line with the number of binding sites for the synthetic orthogonal factor. Very basic experiment in synthetic biology. So the first thing that we did is we then went on to test our library of candidate cis regulatory elements that we'd uh, um, harvested. And one of the first things that we noted is for, for most, but not all of them, if you put multiple copies of these on their own, they really don't do anything. And, you know, but we, we second guessed ourselves. We thought maybe our bioinformatics was wrong. We didn't we didn't select our candidates. We'd done something wrong. But when we started to make combinatorial uh, promoters with, with in which we combined those elements, what we find is that their effect is very much non-additive. So when you have um, multiple cis regulatory elements that are recruiting different types of proteins, it's not additive, you uh, can in fact then get quite significant levels of infection. So one hypothesis could obviously be that they require specific protein-protein interactions to enable transcription. So we can directly test that by making uh, combinatorial rearrangements of those sites within the synthetic promoters. And we did that in two different ways. We did that by uh, altering the relative positions, uh, altering the positions of those relative to each other, and also by adding in flanking sequences of um, different uh, identities. So the important thing here is I'm not going to go through the detail uh, results in detail because the important take home message is none of those things made any differences. There are no specific protein interactions, and what we have rather than any specific protein-protein interactions or enhanceosomes is that we have this cooperative binding mechanism. And uh, at the same time, we're doing our experiments, someone else is doing similar experiments or different types of experiments in um, mammalian cells that came to the same conclusion that cooperative binding without apparent protein-protein interactions are basically the hallmarks of active enhancers. So that's true with... Uh, for a lot of types of transcription factors, but definitely not for all of them. Some of them have particular um, uh, functionalities that are different. And so for the ones in our, I'm not claiming that this is uh, the, the only type of transcription factor that can do this, but within the, um, the pool of transcription factors that we were looking at, for us, the BZIP transcription factors definitely set, up, set out. They could drive transcription very well on their own. And unlike most of the other things that we'd looked at in our, in our minimal synthetic promoters, the location of these really strongly influenced expression. So this is just two different BZIPs and whether they're distant 
mi uh, middle or proximal to the start of transcription. Um, so we think this is also basically cooperative binding and what's special about BZIP transcription factors and has been shown by working molecular dynamics is that BZIP transcription factors can modulate the torsional stress in DNA, inducing local conformations that enable um, the cooperative binding of other transcription factors. So what we actually found is that they therefore have a halo effect of when you have your BZIP transcription factor binding, then the other the other sites that are close to them are also their activity is um, quite significantly enhanced and they couldn't bind on their own. So basically they're functioning like pioneers. So uh, using information about how all of those uh, modular components contribute to transcriptional activity, um, Yao Min wrote a script that uh, basically designed a larger library of minimal synthetic elements by um, selecting a random number of elements and arranging in that variable region. Second script then predicts the strength of that synthetic promoter by assigning a score to each nucleotide position based on the identity of the cis regulatory elements. And that score is um, adjusted by an identity specific numerator, which is dependent on its relative positions to other important elements, so, such as a BZIP element if it's there, or to the transcription factor binding site or uh, the transcription start site. So we sampled that library, synthesized DNA sequences and tested them. And in most of those cases, we found that that correlated pretty well with measured performance. And where we found that it didn't, what we found that because our script was only dropping things in, it was not doing any checking. Definitely when you just drop things in randomly, you will create new sequences. So we were sometimes creating new cis regulatory elements were not in our original pool. And, we were, uh, and some of those were for very well known elements. And we did start to see um, we started to see a uh, movement away from our predictions with those. So we also tested the performance of these as integrated transgenes to see if they are broadly constitutive, which they are. They're not perfectly constitutive, but nothing on the market already is perfectly constitutive. Um, and they have uh, the same relative range of expression levels of the weak ones were weak, the strong ones were strong, as they do in transient assays. So at the end of that work, we felt like we could uh, build minimal synthetic promoters uh, that responded to known regulatory proteins and could pretty well predict their strength well enough, which is good for us. But we wanted to know what was the basis then of promoters that have different levels of expression in response to transcription factor availability in the cell, because this is really important if you want to re-engineer a network in some way, you're going to want to build different strength promoters that build, that respond to different transcription factor nodes in your regulatory elements. So we know I showed you that altering the number of binding sites will change expression for some types of transcription factors, but not necessarily all because position is going to be important and some of them are just it just doesn't help. Um, and also we know that in uh, if we look across a range of natural promoters that are in plants, you can see uh, target genes that will respond by different amplitudes to a given target gene. This is definitely not controlled by the number of binding sites. That's not the way that it happens in nature. But it is well known, obviously, that transcription factors recognize binding motifs and that the sequences uh, of those binding motifs, but not just the core sequences, but the sequences that flank them will affect the structure of the DNA and therefore the binding affinity of that transcription factor uh, for the protein for the DNA. So, so you can ignore the bottom part of the slide. But what's important here, so this is um, data from Sebastian Mejing's lab um, at the Max Planck Center for Molecular Genetics, and it's just data for the um, GR receptor uh, DNA protein binding. And for this particular DNA binding protein, um, uh, altering the flanking sequences of the core binding sites alters the uh, minor groove width and therefore changes uh, the affinity and the amount of transcription that you will get in response to that. So we're doing this work in the pandemic and we didn't have access or funds really to spend lots of money on looking at uh, um, uh, DNA, by, DNA protein binding, but we also need, knew that we needed to get uh, quantitative data. So yeah, Man, Yamin developed this really, really nice, super cheap and reasonably high throughput assay where we can basically just use a split luciferase method for quantifying protein DNA binding. So in this case, we um, can stick our DNA to the plate and then we can add really tiny nanomolar quantities of transcription factor with a tiny um, hybrid ta luciferase targets just at a 11 amino acid 
tag, and then we can quantify that uh, DNA by reconstituting its luciferase activity and measuring it, and we can measure its relative uh, binding to random DNA sequences to look at its relative binding affinity for different sequences. So this is also looking at a BZIP transcription factor. We're just seeing it go up with the amount of protein and uh, disappear when we start putting competitors in there. So what we were able to do then is to build um, synthetic promoters then that are tuned in their responses to transcription factors is that we were able to identify different binding sites, uh, measure those binding sites. So this is the binding affinity assay that I'm pointing to here on the left. So we have different binding sites and then we can uh, put the different strength binding sites uh, in different combinations into the synthetic promoter chassis. But what's important, particularly for these, is they act as dimers and weak, weaker binding sites will still be able to uh, stabilize. If you have a, a, a weak affinity and a strong affinity, you can still stabilize that. So rather than just doing a, a kind of a corollary of strengths and looking at straightforward um, uh, associations, uh, we have different uh, different numbers of weak and strong binding sites to look at how that complex stabilizes on the DNA, and we're able to then to tune our uh, promoter strength uh, in response to a given. So now we have different minimal synthetic promoters that respond with different outputs to the same steady state amount of the same transcription factor in the cell. Okay, so now I'm going to go on and tell you how we use some of those same techniques to think about uh, engineering a plant regulatory network and the uh, network that we've been working on for the last few years is plant responses to nitrate. So first of all, for those of you that um, don't work on plants, why do we want to do that? Uh, nitrogen is essential for plant growth and development um, uh, and we have the crop yields that we do because we add nitrate to our crops, we add uh, ammonia based fertilizers to our crops. But nitrate fertilizers are environmentally damaging in several different ways. The Haber-Bosch process for producing those fertilizers uh, um, produces ammonia from natural gas and oil or coal. Uh, excess applications also produce nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas re released from the soil, and also the nitrate uh, washes into waterways, uh, causing eutrophication. So it's environmentally damaging in uh, many different ways. So there are several ways to negate this process, including engineering soil microbes, uh, biological nitrogen fixation, but addressing the availability and uptake is only a half of the solution at best, um, because uh, source nutrients can only be incorporated into the growth at the rate at which zinc tissues will permit. So classical energy, energy budgeting calculations will show that tissue growth itself, that zinc activity is equally as important as uptake. And there's no evidence at all that these are optimal in crop plants. Um, so we're really interested in the uh, use efficiency of those plants and how it's incorporated <clears throat> and how uh, the growth response in response to nitrate. Uh, so uh, many, many genes in the plants, as you would expect, will uh, change their uh, um, regulatory status in response to nitrate and this uh, will result in the plants exhibiting foraging behavior. So here we're just showing some pretty simple experiments with the amount of nitrate increasing. We're seeing changes in root system ar architecture. This is just the same data graphed. So number of lateral roots, uh, total length of roots. So our collaborator in this uh, project is um, Siobhan Davis at uh, UC Davis, uh, Siobhan Davis, Siobhan Brady at UC Davis, uh, and her lab uh, used yeast one hybrid uh, to identify transcription factors that um, interact in the promoter, promoter regions of genes known to be involved in nitro processes and uh, came up with a very nice regulatory network um, that is predicted to regulate a wide spectrum of root and shoot developments develop processes in response to nitrogen. So within this more complicated network, they propose the, a, a sub-network of transcription factors that regulate each other and the wider transcriptional network essentially coordinate gr root growth in response to nitrate. So uh, as we talked about interactions between those transcription factors and the regulatory sequences basically underlie the logic of that network. Uh, and we also know that within that transcription factor network, we definitely have epistasis, but we're also seeing a, um, a number of different uh, 
network motifs, particularly feed forward loops, which we think uh, is really important for controlling the type of uh, the type, the, uh, the abundance and the robustness of the root growth response in uh, in response to nitrate. So over the last three years, we've been collaborating to refine, characterize and engineer that network and also to determine whether it is um, conserved in crop species. I should have mentioned this was all in a Arabidopsis. OK, so first of all, we wanted to understand how each uh, node in the transcriptional network controls the other nodes, which means we wanted to know where they bind and how strongly and what the regulatory consequences of binding were. So the first thing we wanted to do was, or first thing we did was identify the candidate binding sites in the regions of regulatory DNA where the chromatin is open. Um, so we can use existing data to look at opens of open chromatin, and then we can look for the core sequences of binding. So we looked throughout this network. I'm not going to show you all the data for the whole network in this presentation. We're just going to stick to this little cascade here, which has got our 18 at the top and then ANAC 32 and NLP7. So just here we've got the promoter of ANAC showing the binding sites to RF18 and therefore, and then the same going through this transcriptional cascade here. So to support that use one hybrid um, data, we can see evidence of uh, binding sites. And then we went on to apply, my slides aren't moving. We went on to uh, test the edges that I just showed you using exactly the same relative binding affinity assay uh, that we developed. So now that we can see that we have these reasonably high affinity binding sites uh, in the promoter regions for each promoter to the transcription factors. So we're gaining multiple lines of evidence for, the, for uh, this network and also the pieces of DNA within the network that are important. So the next thing, since we don't know very much about many of these uh, transcription factors, is to know whether they are um, activators or repressors and how much they are activating and repressing in response. So here we uh, measure the regulatory consequences of uh, transcription factor target interactions. And we do this using two different assays. One of them, we measure the uh, endogenous gene. This is quite important because um, if we do it exogenously, we don't have that chromatin structure there. And we can do this just by expressing our transcription factor with a, a um, GR tag. So we can hold it in the cytosol and control its uh, retranslocation to the nucleus with dexamethasone. We can also treat the cells with or without um, cyclohexamide. So we can stop tr uh, translation in any downstream cascades, therefore we can determine whether it's a regulatory change is direct or indirect. So for the same cascade here, we can see RF18 um, being a probably direct uh, repressor of ANAC. ANAC is a direct repressor of NLP7, and NLP7 was already known in the literature. This is always a control of activator of, uh, the, meta uh, of the assimilation gene NIR1. We also do an exogenous assay where we just co-express the uh, transcription factor and the promoter bound to a luciferase gene. And the reason that we do that as well is that allows us to then mutate those binding sites and see which ones are important. So I'm just, again, for swiftness, I'm going to show you just data that we can see that we can abolish the responsiveness of NLP7 to NIR1 by deleting those sites that we've already seen to be important and shown evidence of in vitro binding. So I won't, will not bore you with the extensive amount of data for this forthcoming paper. But what I will show you is that um, we did this for all of our edges in the Arabidopsis sub, sub network. In Siobhan's lab, they also identify putative orthologs in tomato. Uh, and then they did exactly the same experiments as we'd already done in Arabidopsis and what we see is that there is partial con conservation of the network. Several of the hubs are uh, or several of the nodes are conserved, but we also have some rewiring. Some of these genes just, it's not, they don't, they do not have an author leg that's expressed in the same tissues in tomato. And some of them we see basically the topology of those feed forward loops being changed. So our next question was then, does, do these models predict to the expressions of genes in mutant lines. So the first set of mutant lines is just straightforward loss of function lines, uh, and we can test those. We can test a, an actual phenotype, and we can also test a molecular phenotype. The molecular phenotype is actually a little bit easier to understand, partly because the assay is a lot cleaner. So we can use a synthetic promoter basically with the luciferase gene that sits downstream of the network. 
and, uh, and then we can look at mutations in these different genes and we can uh, um, so uh, this reporter uh, normally in a wild type plant will see expression go up in response to nitrate, which is what we want. It's basically acting as a, a proxy of nitrate status in our NLP7 lines, as is widely known in the literature. And as we would expect, we lose that nitrate responsiveness. Uh, and then in our repressor of this widely known activator, we do see a little bit of a upregulation. And then the repressor of the repressor, we see something else. We do also see some changes in that make sense in the um, uh, root system architecture. So we see changes to the root system architecture, but it requires a lot more explanation to understand those. So what we're currently doing uh, ongoing is we have a CRISPR library of mutations uh, um, throughout the promoter regions of those genes, which have mutations of some of those binding sites. So there we're not actually just missing the nodes. So all of those nodes, moonlight and other things. So we, we know that we don't, that's not the way that we want to go about engineering nitrate responses. So that ARF18 at the top of that uh, cascade is also involved in shade responses and ac 32 is also involved in sugar signaling. So what we've done instead is we've been trying to uh, unpick this network by um, mutating uh, binding sites and to try to misregulate those feed forward loops within the network. And again, we are we uh, validated that some of these binding sites that are missing and we are seeing some um, uh, phenotypes, but we need to do a little bit more, a few more repeats of those before I feel comfortable talking about those. The other thing that we've done is we've built some minimal synthetic promoters that respond to some of these transcription factors that we've been able to tune in the way that I've shown you. And we're using those to uh, build uh, um, synthetic genetic feedback into these networks. So we can use these to control the expression of genes further up. And then we can see how those network motifs are functioning to, um, to, for the robustness. So our hypothesis basically is that feedback will improve the robustness of the response. And we should get, see more often see lateral root formation in response to nitrate. And then the last thing that we're looking at is that we know that uh, I, I've definitely simplified the description of this network. It sounds like all of these net genes are all expressed in the same cell types all the time. They definitely are not. Some of them are expressed in most of the root cells, at least in all of the epidermal cells. Some of them have incredibly specific patterns of uh, expression and are only expressed uh, in the stem cells behind the uh, lateral root formations. So we're also um, uh, gathering single cell sequencing data for our wild type and mutant lines in response to nitrate. So to summarise that first part, we've used rebuilding approaches to elucidate uh, um, how cis regulatory elements contribute to regulatory function um, and then use that to computationally design synthetic promoters of predictable strength. And we've also characterised a nitrogen responsive gene regulatory network and identified some rewiring between plant lineages and use network models to um, predict so far the effects of relatively simplistic perturbations with more complex ones to come. So in the second half, I am going to maybe a bit less than half, I'm going to talk about um, how we apply our knowledge of gene regulation metabolic pathways, uh, to metabolic pathways, uh, and how we re reprogram cells to make plant metabolites. Uh, and, uh, and then just briefly at the end, a little bit on pathway discovery and characterization. So we are producing all of our uh, molecules of interest in the Cotiana benthamiana, which I know some people in this audience will work on. Uh, so benthamiana is a, um, a scalable plant production chassis. It's mostly used for proteins. Um, it's been used for producing uh, ZMAP, which is used in as a, a monoclonal antibody therapy for Ebola, Cobifens, which is obviously a COVID vaccine, and Thalmatin 2, which is a sweetener. Um, you can use it at different scales, like part leaf scale, a few plant scale, thousands of plant scale. Um, uh, and uh, we do this basically by delivering DNA to the plants using Agrobacterium tumor fascians as a shuttle chassis. Um, uh, as well as being a uh, useful production system or um, in uh, contained use production system. It's also a useful prototyping platform for Nicotiana tobacco, which is field tobacco. Uh, so Benthamiana is not great for field production. It's got very low biomass. It's a 
rapid cycling plant, but tobacco is a high biomass plant. So it's been, it has lots of, it's been bred basically for field traits. And there's a large community of low income community, a uh, large community of low income uh, farmers whose land and processing infrastructure is not particularly well suited for making anything other than tobacco uh, and some countries are uh, particularly Spain are really interested in convert being able to convert those communities across to being full production of high value products um, rather than uh, nicotine. So one of the molecules that we have been making in uh, Benthamiana uh, insect sex pheromones. So uh, um, uh, sex pheromones are highly specific substances often emitted by virgin female insects to attract a mate. They are already pretty successfully employed in crop protection, uh, but, uh, but only for a few pests. Um, or, and that's because all the current products uh, utilise chemical synthesis, but a lot of insect pheromones are too complex for uh, high scale production using chemical synthesis because they have complex stereochemistry or large cyclized uh, um, molecules. So as a proof of concept, we've been working with Diego Orges in Valencia to produce uh, insect pheromones, starting with lepidopteran pheromones, which are fatty acid based pheromones. Uh, and uh, in work, this started life as an iGEM project, in fact, uh, as a project called, which is why it's called Sexy Plant. We wouldn't usually call it a grant that, <laughs> um, <laughs> although maybe we should have. <laughs> so uh, basically, by expressing these three genes uh, in plants, uh, we're able to uh, uh, produce all the pheromone components. So what's really important to understand about lepidoptera and pheromones is it's not a single molecule that's conferring species specificity, it's the ratio of the alcohol, aldehyde and acetate components of the blend that confer that specificity. So controlling those ratios is really important. And other people worked on this before, uh, even before Diego had, and it was the control of those ratios that um, they all flagged as being difficult. So this is something that I was really keen to do. Um, so uh, we, in our project with Yogo, then we uh, use low cost molecular switches to enable scalable production. So uh, one of the things that we use, we want, knew we were going to have to scale this up. There was no way that we we're going to be using any of the lovely drugs that we used in the lab that are quite expensive for scaled up production. So we applied and demonstrated the use of a copper inducible switch, which is, has a really nice but low background level. So here I'm just literally showing you for simplicity with and without the copper. These are the main pheromone components, which are the alcohol and the acetate. And then uh, the thing that we realized, I should take a step back. I know I realized I missed out a key piece of data. When we were um, when we had our first generation of these plants, what we realized is that we weren't really making the correct ratio of these molecules. But also when we did our RNA seq of those lines, they were not being expressed particularly well. We we're getting a lot of expression of this gene, not very much expression of this gene and various other problems that we could observe. And we, we knew we primarily needed to boost the acetate component of our pheromones to hit our target species. So one of the things that we observe is when we start taking our lovely uh, individual transcriptional units, which we feel we were, have become real experts at being able to predict how much they uh, express, when we start building complex multi-gene constructs and we put them together, everything that we knew goes out the window. They behave completely differently. So what's important about this diagram here, or this set of data, is down at the bottom, these are two, uh, two genes, just two reporters, same regulatory elements expressed in trans. Uh, and you can co-infiltrate those, and as you would expect, you get fairly equal expression patterns. You can control the relative quantities by the amount of the bacteria. It's really simple. You do exactly the same thing and start putting these things together on in cis onto the same piece of DNA. You will just get a lot of expression from whichever the gene is that's first is. So you will get a, a lot of a lot less. So we've we've got two strands of research around this. One of this is just utilizing this and the other is preventing it. I'm only really going to talk about utilization. Um so uh um for our pheromone project what we basically did is just you did a combination combinatorial assembly changing the different relative positions of our genes and this allowed us to change the amount and the relative promotion proportions of our pheromones without doing any particularly complex 
uh, engineering of any of the individual transcriptional units just by changing their relative uh, positions. I feel like I was going to say something else and I've forgotten it, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> a different molecule that we've worked on producing, which is infinitely more complex molecule, is uh, strictosidine. So strictosidine is a monoterpene indole alkaloid. Uh, many MIAs are used uh, in medicine. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, Vin Blasten and Vin Christine are MIAs for which uh, strictosidine is the is a, a midway point or first committed step of MIA biosynthesis. Um, and they're very hard uh, um, molecules to, uh, they're definitely difficult to chemically synthesize, but also difficult to biologically produce. We were able to uh, um, get to expression of or obtain strictosidine in benthamiana by co-expression of 14 different genes uh, from primary metabolism. I'm not going to go through this data. In, uh, it, it, this is literally just here to demonstrate um, the last, the rebuilding of the last few steps of the pathway and showing the conversion of those steps over and that we can produce strictosidine. What I actually want to focus on is some of the problems that we encountered having done this part of the project. This is interesting. There were interesting things about the story, but not as much as many as the problems. So uh, the problem is that Nicotiana is it's really easy to reconstitute things in, but it has its own rich endogenous metabolism. We are producing a lot of alkaloids. It contains a lot of alkaloids. It's quite difficult to pure away our alkaloids away from its alkaloids. The other thing is it, uh, because it's producing things in this pathway, it has a tendency to derivatize midpoints in that uh, uh, in the early pathway, uh, particularly by adding uh, uh, glucose or sugar groups anyway. So to tackle the first problem, we thought it was going to be a super easy experiment. We just knock out this gene that they'd knocked out in tobacco and, and gave them low nicotine or gave them, well, as reported at the time, no nicotine. Um, uh, so uh, we did a basically a CRISPR experiment. We found um, the uh, uh, five orthologs of this gene in Benthamiana. One of them already had a premature stop codon. So we put, um, basically made some plants. And this is just showing you different lines. Every time we have a green box here, we've got a mutation. So we've got mutations in individual genes, combinations of genes, and in all of the genes. And as you can see, when we knock out some of those genes or all of those genes, nicotine content goes down, but it doesn't disappear. And I mean, really, this was fine for us, but we were slightly irritated by the fact that there was no not no nicotine and we really wanted there to be no nicotine. We felt like we'd done everything that uh, we had been uh, said would work. So um, we started to think about what might be happening. We really didn't think there was any other possible candidate for formation. So we all we, all we could do is hypothesize that that last step was also able to happen spontaneously. If it was able to happen spontaneously, we know that uh, um, in tobacco plants of all species, we usually only see S nicotine. And sure enough, in our plants, our uh, nicotine content is pretty much fully racemic. We're seeing both S and R nicotine, uh, which is uh, which you'd expect for a non-enzymatic reaction. Further, then we were able to further investigate. So, sorry, this tells us something important about what that enzyme is doing, which is completely unknown before. The final steps of nicotine biosynthesis have, have been a bit fuzzy. People don't know how those enzymes work. We do know, therefore, that this enzyme is putting the stereocenter into nicotine. We can also uh, feed those plants with a uh, deuterated nicotinamide. And we can see that in our wild type plants, we mostly see D3, which is so we're seeing an abstraction of the uh, of the deuterine from here, whereas in our mutant plants, we no longer see that we accumulate D4. So we can also conclude that those, uh, those BBL enzymes, as well as controlling that stereocenter, are also involved in the hydrogen uh, hydrogen abstraction from that pyridine ring. So it's kind of nice that this side project led to elucidation of this really iconic um, biosynthetic pathway. But our other problem is, ooh, let me go back. Our other problem, is my laptop hates the slide apparently. 
Okay, our other problem is that we see derivatization. So this is the same, uh, the, these are the first five steps of our uh, strixtosidine pathway. And this is the LCMS. We're not really looking at um, these particular molecules because they're nonpolar. What we are looking at here is all the derivatives of them that we see in BEMP that we don't want to see. And as you can see, these are basically all got exile groups on them that we wish were not here. So we're seeing derivatization of our products. So we know that these are probably being added by uh, glycosyl transferases. We also know that the benth genome has got 200 of them. So the question for us in, in a metabolic engineering uh, experiment is how do you identify which DT is acting on your substrate if you don't want to, you know, clone and express and do specificity um, experiments with all of them. So what we decided to do is a uh, transcriptional experiment where we'd introduce Infiltrate our plants with either just GFP as a control for the transcriptional response that we expect to see for infiltration. Uh, the first couple of the genes of the pathway, a few more genes of the pathway, and look at what's upregulated. So, as you'd expect, we see lots of genes that are just upregulated by infiltration. We see some that are upregulated by infiltration again by the pathway, and we see some that are only upregulated by the pathway. So, we're able to use this pipe applying together with some knowledge of the classes of UGTs that are involved uh, with those types of substrates to pick candidate genes. And again, we made CRISPR lines of the individual or combinations of these groups of UGTs. We then re-infiltrated them with the pathway either up to those two uh, pathway midpoints, geraniol and petalactol. And what we were very happily able to see, so each one of these columns corresponds to one of the peaks that we never never wanted to see on our CMS. And what we see is that in some of our knockout lines, then we're seeing the total ablation of some of those peaks. So we kind of have a, now a pathway to be able to identify endogenous genes that are involved in uh, glycosylation, on unwanted glycosylation in this case, of particular compounds, which is still quite a lot of work, but it's definitely a lot, a lot less work than expressing and uh, doing, you know, a characterization of individual enzymes. OK, so the last couple of minutes before I finish, I think I've still got a couple of minutes. Um, I'm going to talk about our pathway uh, discovery. So for all of the things I told you about when we started working on those, we knew what all the pathway genes were. So what happens if you don't and you need that pathway for reconstruction in heterologous hosts? So plants produce many natural bio, natural products that are useful. Most of the pathways are unknown. And also um, many extracts of plants, uh, ethnopharmacological studies have shown to be bioactive, but in many cases, the exact molecule responsible for bioactivity is unknown. So we have been working with calendula officinalis or pot marigold, which is an ancient medicinal herb. There's evidence of use by the Romans right up, actually it was introduced to Britain by the Romans, and there's evidence of its use right up until World War One and the American Civil War, where uh, people use, pulled off the petals and used them as cortices to pack wounds. Still used in lots of different remedies. Uh, we can see that those extracts are anti-inflammatory and there's reasonable evidence of the literature that the, uh, the extracts are anti-inflammatory and are enriched in a class of compounds known as triterpene fatty acid esters. Um, so in our project, we wanted to investigate if it's all of these, a specific molecule, and see if we could clone the biosynthetic pathway. So the first thing we can do is look at uh, where these molecules accumulate. And indeed, we see that they do accumulate pretty much only in the ray florets, which is the where people have been using them. Uh, um, uh, that's the extracts that have been used. But when we look at uh, the ray florets of different, uh, many different Asteraceae species, we see that we see these triterpene fatty acid esters in almost all species. However, in our marigold species, what we do see is a, a particular type of scaffold, a theradiol. Uh, and when we do comparative um, anti-inflammatory activity, we can see that those extracts that are high in this particular fatty acid ester, we see we have more anti-inflammatory activity. So what's special about this molecule? Uh, basically, it has a C16 hydroxylation of its backbone triterpene scaffold. This is really interesting because C16 hydroxylations of other triterpene scaffolds have been shown to confer by, uh, 
other, like antimicrobial bioactivity for other molecules. So this becomes a really strong candidate for this. So to discover its uh, biosynthetic pathway, we have a genome. We can then uh, integrate um, transcript transcriptomics and metabolomics of multiple tissues uh, and use what we know about phylogenomics and structural biology to start picking candidate genes from the relevant gene families. Now for the gene families, it's pretty easy to understand what they are. So our final molecule is a triterpene fatty acid, is a triterpene, it's this five ringed 30 carbon structure. We know it has the C16 hydroxylation and we know it has this uh, fatty acid tail, usually a myristate or a palmitate. So uh, we know that all triterpenes are made from this linear molecule, 2,3-oxidosqualene. So we know that first of all, we're looking for a oxidosqualene cyclase to make the triterpene. We know then we're looking for a cytochrome P450 to add on this group, and we know that we're adding, looking for an acyl transferase to add this group. We can then narrow them down for what exists in the genome using transcriptomics and metabolomics co-expression and what they're related to. So to cut that story short, we were able to uh, pick out our candidates. We only have for the uh, oxidosqualine cyclase, there's only 17 in the genome. It's quite easy to pick the right one. For the SIPs, as you can imagine, there's a couple of hundred. It's much harder. So for those who had to test, you know, more of the handfuls to get them. But here I can just show you reconstitution of that biosynthesis in benthamiana. So our control line at the top, we're not expressing any of these genes. Uh, benth doesn't express a lot of triterpenes, so you don't see a lot. Uh, if we can see the scaffold, uh, and if we just express the oxidosqualine cyclase, the hydroxylated scaffold with the SIP, and then we can see our triterpene fatty acid ester. So what we're doing now is purifying that molecule and then testing its bioactivity to see if we can tie bioactivity to the specific molecule and then improve the biosynthesis of this molecule. Okay, so in that second part, I've shown you that we can produce different types of molecules, sex pheromones, monoterpene and dialkaloids, triterpenes and benth. We can uh, improve that chassis to reduce derivatization and uh, com um, compounds that interfere with purification. And we can use integrated, and bio uh, integrated omics and bioassays to rebuild uh, pathways and identify um, uh, bioactive compounds. So I will finish there and say thank you mainly to everyone in my lab. They were mentioned on most of the slides, uh, also to the Biofoundry uh, and most of all to our collaborators, particularly Siobhan Brady at UC Davis for the work in um, uh, Arabidopsis and Maria O'Connell for UEA for helping us uh, get started with human cell lines for doing bioactivity assays.